Hello everyone and welcome back to day 25 of Bitwise where we build a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, last time we uh, jumped in and um, between the mainstream and the extra stream um, wrote um, the beginnings of a dynamic assembler so the kind of assembler that um, kind of runs at runtime dynamically and assembles directly into a memory buffer as opposed to something that uh, kind of runs offline and, and creates a memory image uh, or a binary image or in some finite uh, in some format that gets loaded later. Um, and uh, I can't remember exactly what we got done in the mainstream versus the extra stream, so I'm just going to quickly review uh, where we got to, and uh, hopefully that will catch everyone up, even if they only watched the, the mainstream from last time. Um, and then after that, um, I will... Um, I will just continue kind of where we left off. I didn't get much done off stream except for some cleanup, so it will pretty much just be a direct continuation of where we were last time. Um, so um, let me show you the demo code, um, which will kind of explain what we can do, and then I'll make some some notes uh, on on how it's accomplished. Um, so um, we have this simple. A uh, single step uh, run loop for the emulator where every time we press enter it steps the processor uh, one cycle um, runs the next instruction and then prints the, the register file in the program counter state um, and so you can just kind of press enter and lean on enter if you want to just step through it quickly um, and so uh, in order to actually make that thing do something useful we uh, we fill in the RAM with pre-assembled data and instructions for uh, the program we want to run and so the, the job of the, the, this dynamic assembler is essentially to fill in some data in that buffer. Um, that's the idea. And so there's this uh, as instruct where you point it to a buffer you want it to fill in, say how big the buffer is. Um, and then you issue these commands that act much like, um, you know, uh, statements in a traditional offline assembler, but everything operates here at, uh, at runtime. And um, and so you have these basic directives that correspond to instructions or pseudo instructions like this thing loads a word, this thing does a branch, this is a register to register op, um, and you can see the op is add and destination is x2, uh, source 1 is x2, source 2 is x1, and so on. If you have an immediate op, you use this uh, other function, and in which case the rs2 argument is replaced by an immediate argument. Uh, in addition to that, you also have... Um, I guess the thing to note here is that um, whereas the low-level instruction set, of course, operates um, directly in terms of things like registers and um, immediates, uh, some of these functions uh, offer a higher-level interface than that that's more along the lines of what you want either a human programmer or a uh, code generator to, uh, to use, uh, which uh, when you're doing a load word, uh, you specify the destination where you want to put the loaded word, but then you specify a, a label or a symbol. Um, where you want to load it from. And so um, both for load and store word and for the branches, um, the, the sort of the high level interface works with symbols rather than direct registers and offsets and stuff like that. So it, it's more uh, like a normal assembler where you have labels that you can use to refer to, um, to uh, points in the program and data in memory. Um, and so in, in, in this case here, let me just explain this program. Um, you can see we have a, uh, a bit of, of data memory we reserve here um, called count, and uh, it's a uh, uint32. It contains the value 10, so that's pre-initialized into the RAM, and, um, and we create a label that refers to this location. Um, and then here we have um, the result of the computation will be stored here, and uh, it starts out as zero, but it's also a uint32, so we reserve the space for that. And then immediately afterwards, uh, the, the program actually starts. We create a label to refer to the first instruction of this program so that uh, once we initialize the, uh, the CPU core, we can point the initial instruction pointer to that start address. Um, but the program consists of the following instructions. First off, it loads, um, it loads the count from this memory location into a register. In this case, you, know, you can imagine we could have hard-coded the uh, the value of that register directly, but I just wanted to show kind of, you know, you can imagine this was was a function of some sort and it's actually loading this from a global variable where it doesn't know in advance what the value is. But anyway, it loads that global variable um, using that symbol into X1. Um, and then it creates, and this is, um, 
it creates a, a loop level, which uh, points to the top of the loop. Uh, and it creates a done label with, or a done symbol, which is, you can see it just says new sim. It doesn't say new sim here. So we essentially create a, um, a symbol, but we haven't resolved it yet. So you can refer to it before it's been resolved in this case, because you want to do a, a forward branch. Um, and so the logic here is we compare uh, x1, which is our loop count, with x0, which is always 0. It's a pseudo register. Uh, and so basically what this says is if x1 is equal to 0, then skip to the done label, which at this point in the program, or in, in, at this point in the uh, assembly, has not been resolved yet. Um, so that's going to be resolved later. Um, but if that doesn't, if we don't jump to the end, then we execute the body of the loop, which is simply. Um, adding x1 to x2, so x2 is the accumulator, it's implicitly initialized to zero, uh, and then decrementing x1, so it starts at 10, and so the next iteration it would go to nine, and then jumping unconditionally back up to the top of the loop. Um, and um, you, there's a slightly more efficient implementation of this where uh, you don't have a uh, unconditional jump at the end of the loop, but the actual loop condition uh, here is uh, kind of tested down here basically and uh, um, and then on the first time entering the loop you jump to the end to check that condition but here i wrote it like this just for uh, i don't know why not it, it doesn't really matter um, but then anyway uh, after the loop uh, after this unconditional jump in the body we have uh, the done label is now being resolved so this is uh, now we're saying here is where the done label should point and uh, what it does is it takes the final accumulator in X2 and it puts it in uh, in this result global, which is uh, this bit of memory reserved up here. Um, X1 here is a temp register. And um, this is something that, um, that you need uh, to uh, store a temporary value for the offset uh, when you're doing your, your load, uh, or, or you're doing your store rather. Um, so you can see you pass in this temp register here and uh, it's used to store um, store temporary value in order to do this computation. So um, you could abstract this away by having a always reserved temp register that's used for this sort of thing. But for a low-level interface like this, uh, you want any you know code generator that uses this function to manage its own registers. So it's not trying to do register allocation for you or reserve any registers or anything. Um, and so it, it has to take that as an explicit argument. In this case, we just use x1, which at this point in the code is not used for anything. It should, in fact, be 0. Um, so we could have used any other register. We, we don't really care about this value. It's just we need a slot that we can overwrite temporarily uh, to execute this uh, pseudo instruction, store word. Anyway, um, so um, let me, let me uh, talk about how some of this stuff works. Um, we first have have this whole symbol allocation thing, which just allocates a sim, uh, a sim struct. And if you look at what the sim struct contains, um, it has a state, so it can be unresolved or resolved. And so unresolved means you know it's been allocated, but we don't know where it points to yet. Uh, it, if it has been resolved, then, then this adder field points to the actual address. Um, and uh, ref here is um, part of how we do back patching. So. This is really, um, in some sense, the real reason why these data structures are here. Um, if you um, if you assemble an instruction or really make any reference to a symbol that has not been resolved yet, then we need to do backpatching. And uh, the idea behind backpatching is when you make these references to so far unresolved symbols, you uh, you allocate a new uh, a new struct called a simref and you link it into a chain that's associated with the symbol. And then once the symbol is eventually resolved and we know its actual location and memory, we can then go through that, whole, that reference chain. And for each of them, we can fix up, um, fix up those instructions or whatever they are to point to the final location now that it's resolved. So if you look at the simref struct, you can see um, right now we have two different kinds of references. Um, um, but but in terms of the, you can see there's this next pointer which points to the next thing in the chain. So if there's ten symbol, uh, if there's ten instructions that refer to a symbol that's been uh, that's not resolved yet, um, this would point to the most recent uh, reference, and then this uh, pointer chain uh, going through ne the next field uh, points all the way down to all those ten references. Um, and uh, in our case, we just have two kinds of references: uh, so-called low offset and high offset. Um, 
and I'll show you what that is used for in a second. Uh, but really what it boils down to is uh, if we take load word as an example, so this is the high level load word pseudo instruction. Um, you can see we say uh, what, what register should you put the result of loading into and what symbol are we loading from. And um, uh, this has changed a little bit from the extra stream to remove some redundant code. But um, the idea here is first off we have to choose, because we're calculating offsets, we have to choose a base address to use for these offset calculations. And um, the, the base address is basically the address of this uh, AUI PC instruction at upper immediate to program counter instruction. And so we store that off. Um, and then we just fill in a zero value for the immediate because we're actually going to use this instruction. Or sorry, we're going to use this function to actually handle the offset calculations. And so this does two things. One is if the symbol we're referring to is already resolved, then it just does the, um, the offset calculation for us as specified. So in this case, we say this is a high offset calculation and the base address we want to use for the calculation is the space variable. Um, and this is the symbol it's associated with, of course. Um, and similarly here, this is the low offset and same thing, right? So using the same base for both of these cases. But you can see we just fill in a zero value for the immediate um, because this function is going to do the work of actually filling that in. So um, let's look at that. Um, so what this function does is it takes the symbol you're uh, referencing for the offset and says what kind of reference is it. So right now there's only low offset, and high offset, and a base address to use for the offset calculation. And so in order to calculate the instruction to fix up, you can see it takes the current uh, assembler address, which is kind of one instruction passed. So you're supposed to call this function after the instruction has been assembled um, with a dummy value for the offset. Uh, and so this just subtracts off the size of the last instruction. Um, if we were supporting uh, two byte instructions for the compressed extension, we would probably have to do this a little bit differently, but um, this works for now. And so you can see there's two cases, like I mentioned, um, if, uh, let's look at the resolve case first. If the symbol we're referring to has already been resolved, then we know what address it has. Then we just call this resolve simref uh, thing directly. And um, if you go and look at that, you can see that it, uh, it takes the reference address and um, gets the instruction pointer. And so again, here is assuming it's a 32-bit uh, instruction, gets the instruction pointer, decodes it. Um, so we, we're, here we're exploiting the fact that we have a full round tripable decoder and encoder. So um, this is maybe not the most efficient thing to do because we're actually decoding the whole instruction just in order to patch the immediate. But it means that um, this symbol resolving stuff can be a ton simpler since it doesn't have to worry about exactly what kind of immediate field it's patching. It really, the only thing it needs to know is at a higher level, is it a low offset or a high offset? But it doesn't need to know, is it a J immediate or a B immediate or whatever? It just needs, uh, it really leans on the decoder to figure that out. Uh, which simplifies the code tremendously, even though it's maybe a little bit inefficient, although not by much, I think. Um, but anyway, uh, uses the reference address to uh, get the instruction pointer, then decodes that instruction using the existing function we wrote. This is the same function we also use in the simulator, so this is getting a lot of mileage already. Um, and then depending on the kind of reference, we, uh, we overwrite the immediate field of that instruction in one of two possible ways. Uh, in both cases, though, we, uh, we write the offset we write an offset, which is a, a difference between two addresses rather than an absolute address or something like that. Um, and then we have this function here, m low and m high, which um, uh, rejiggles the, uh, it actually only does something for the high case. But if you look at this uh, m high function, uh, basically what it does is it adds a, a bias in order to conditionally add one um, to the upper 20 bits if the, uh, if the 12th bit uh, which is the sign bit of the lower portion, if that's one. Um, so this just uh, basically compensates for the fact that when you um, when you do this two-part um, low offset, high offset computation, uh, you get a sign extension of the lower 12 bits. And so this is just compensating for that, um, kind of anticipating that that's going to happen and um, biasing the high uh, operand uh, immediate bits accordingly. But uh, anyway, you can see this is conceptually quite simple. Uh, decode it. Um, overwrite it with the the uh, the offset run through this uh, biasing operation and then re-encoding it into the same location. So that's how you resolve the simref. Um, and that's what happens if you call this uh, asm ref offset function with an already resolved symbol. 
but um, that assumes we already know the address because otherwise we can't do this uh, offset calculation because sim adder wouldn't have a meaningful value. So in the case where it's unresolved at the point at which we refer to it, um, this is where we have to defer the resolving using backpatching. So what we do is we create this, uh, we, we, uh, we allocate a reference, we fill it in with the, with the values we need to know in order to do this uh, task later, and then we link it into the chain. Um, so you can see we fill in the next field to point to the existing uh, head of that chain, and then we make it the new head of the chain. So this is just a standard singly linked list uh, link operation. Um, and then eventually when, um, when we do resolve this um, symbol, we call set sim here on a symbol, and it resolves the symbol to the current uh, target address for the assembler, and uh, set it to resolve, you know, set, it, set its address to what it should be, and then we run through the, the reference chain and um, um, and call this resolve sim ref function. So this is called in two cases. One is when you're trying to refer to a symbol that's already been resolved. It will just call it, call it immediately. But also in this case where it has to defer it, it will call it after the fact once you know its value, uh, once you know the symbol's address value. Um, and that's really all there is to it. And uh, I have a, a dumb allocator right now where I allocate... Um, I basically have a free list allocator for um, uh, for symbols and symbol references, and so uh, anytime you call new sim or new sim ref, it always tries to satisfy it out of the, the appropriate free list. Uh, but if there isn't anything in the free list, it allocates a new block, links them into the free list, etc. So not very interesting, but uh, at least some minimum effort into the memory allocation. Um, previously, I just did an allocate uh, for um, for symbol for symbol ref, which was made me feel a little bit bad. So uh, this is a tiny bit better without much effort. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much um, that's pretty much it. Uh, other than that, I mean, just to quickly run through it, this is the new thing I added. This is something you see in most assemblers, which is adjusting the um, the address uh, value to align to a certain boundary. And here I'm not assuming power of two because it's not very frequently executed. Um, so I just do the slow division-based uh, alignment. And so, for example, um, this is something that if you have a, uh, you know, something like a C compiler and it's initializing uh, static data, like global variables and such, it will do the equivalent of this for you, um, just like it would when laying out fields in the struct. Um, it would bump the target pointer uh, in order to satisfy the alignment of the data. It's uh, it's it's, alloc uh, it's statically allocating in a memory image, you know, in a uh, in a section in an elf file or something like that. Um, so this is just a function that does that for you. Uh, and then this is just really a function for appending bytes to um, to the buffer at some specified location. And all the other functions for, uh, for putting data there uses that as the workhorse. Um, and so here's just putting different kinds of data in. Here's putting an instruction in. When you put an instruction in, it just encodes it using our assisting encode function and then emits a UNT32 corresponding to that encoding. Um, and here we just have some front end functions for different kinds of register ops. Um, so this is when you have uh, two register source operands. Here is when you have one source register and one source immediate. Uh, and then some specialized instructions here that are separate. Um, and so, yeah, um, pretty, pretty simple. Um, there is, uh, if you saw me on stream last time, there was some pretty nasty debugging things. Uh, probably the nastiest was there was a bug in encoding S immediates, I think. S immediates are 12-bit immediates that are used as a um, address offset for store instructions. Um, and I guess that hadn't gotten exercised very well by my testing. And so I didn't really suspect it because I thought I had tested that code and there were some really basic bugs there. Uh, and that was probably the nastiest one because that sent me on a wild goose chase into unrelated parts of the code. And so once I actually uh, tracked that down, it was uh, easy to fix. But um, I thought that part of the code was more dependable. So there were, you know, when you have these kind of bit manipulation type things and things get slightly off, um, it can be a pain in the butt to debug. But uh, we got that done and, uh, and went through it. I think I added this after the stream as well. This is one of the recommended pseudo instructions in the instruction manual. So this is not a built in instruction. This is a pseudo instruction. It's just a uh, load address. And uh, really what it does is it gives you the apps, you know, it gives you in a specified register of your choice, it gives you um, the address of a symbol. So then you can do, you know, you can do a direct 
load reg or something like that you can um, do anything with it you want this is roughly the equivalent of something like lea i guess on um, on x86 or um, i suppose yeah other processors have this too but basically it gives you the address of something and puts it in a um, uh, puts it in a, in a register of your choice so you can do stuff with it further from that point um and uh yeah for branches the, the the code for branches is remarkably similar um for branches unlike some of these other cases um for conditional branches you don't really have a direct support for uh, kind of long distance um offsets and so uh, you don't have to handle this sort of high offset and low offset combination uh, if you want to do the equivalent of a conditional long distance offset you sort of have to do a short distance uh, uh, short distance conditional branch followed by a unconditional long distance jump something like that um, but it, it means that this is a bit simpler than some of these other cases um, and I guess in this case here we also don't support um, long distance you you have to use j i guess j a l r um in order to do long distance stuff um but uh but yeah so this is uh, you can see it uses the same low offset um ref offset call um and the reason this works is again because we use the um the instruction decoder and encoder for this round tripping um because under the hood of course uh, the kind of immediate encoding that's used for branches, so-called B immediates, is quite different from what's used for, uh, say, S immediates in this case. Um, but from this vantage point, they look the same. They're both um, low offset immediates. And so um, that's pretty nice that the code just uh, kind of unifies in that way, even though it does have a tiny performance cost, but uh, not one that I think I'm likely to to uh, worry about. Um, and yeah, uh, J is another pseudo instruction. It just um, st stands for jump, uh, and it just uses the jump and link uh, instruction with a uh, you know the the zero pseudo pseudo register, which just means hey, I don't actually care about the uh, the next instruction address. Just uh, throw it away. I just want to jump. And uh, and again, this thing here just uses low offset. It, it's the same kind of thing we use for loads and stores branches. And, and jump and link so um, pretty straightforward actually um, all right let me uh, quickly see if there's uh, questions about that and then I will move on to the thing I thought we would work on today oh so someone's saying that the hum is back that's annoying I thought that was gone because I'm using my powered USB hub which seemed to fix the issue previously um, I will try to, maybe it's because I have too much stuff in this hub. Let me try to unplug some stuff for a moment. All right. Um, I will just try to stay... Uh, I'll try not to move my head, and then I'll try to debug it later. I, I could have sworn that um, when I finally moved to the powered USB hub, hub everything was, was fine and dandy. Um, anyway, sorry about that. I will try to stay stationary. So, um, I, um, I didn't want to jump into a huge big thing that would be left incomplete um, for today, because like I said, I... Um, I don't feel super great and uh, don't know um, how far I would be able to get if it's something very complicated. So I thought uh, one thing that would be fun to do for today would be to first um, add some basic memory mapped I.O. Uh, and basically for now, this would just be hooking up get char and put char to, um, to certain addresses in memory so that when you read and write from those addresses, you uh, have a side effect, um, which in, in this case, in this emulated environment, would just be a, a get char and a put char, so it would just be standard I/O, um, and um, and then go, uh, using that, um, maybe we could um, write some, um, I don't know, maybe maybe write some assembly code and a simple code generator that uses the uh, the dynamic assembler to do something interesting. But um, let's um, let's try to show how to do the simple memory mapped I/O first. Um, so uh, right now, if you look at 
uh, the uh, the simulator um, when it sees a uh, load or a store instruction it just calls uh, these load word load byte and load half word uh, functions store byte store half word store store word functions and um, right now all they do is um, they do a bounce check but other than that um, they just defer to the RAM so pretty simple in that way um, I thought what we could do and um, this won't be how this is not the sort of nice modular way of doing it long term but um, typically the way you support memory mapped IO um, in emulators is you have some sort of memory map um, and uh, quite often, I mean, there's different ways of slicing it, right? But like one way of doing it is you have some sort of memory map representation where you say, um, you know, for any loader store that falls in this memory range from A to B, um, if someone does a loader store in that range, defer to this function. So you basically have a callback, and um, that's sort of a, a pretty decent way of uh, offering a modular architecture where you can hook in different peripherals that respond to different memory ranges, and then those functions can do whatever. Um, and when you do that, for uh, for efficiency's sake, you you quite often do want to have a fast path for RAM because the overwhelming majority of reads and writes um, is for RAMs, and so you want to make those as fast as possible. We're not going to be super concerned about performance right now, but that's just to say that even if you have this kind of um, dynamically you know, dynamic from the point of view of the emulator, dynamically extendable memory mapping with the callbacks for different memory ranges, you typically do want to have some sort of fast path for RAM. So you can imagine uh, you would still want to have this kind of uh, uh, if check uh, that defers directly to a, 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 you know, an array indexing operation. You would want to have this sort of at the top of your function for loads and stores, but then maybe if it falls outside of the RAM range, you defer to the general memory mapping dispatch function that goes through memory map, uh, I mean, who knows how it's implemented. It could be a binary tree, could be a linear array, could be a try, um, but ultimately is probably served by some callbacks once you know what uh, memory range your, uh, your request falls in. Um, but for now, let's just hard code it um, to, to kind of make the point. And so um, I'm only going to support it for, uh, for um, Word. Um, Word, well, both word aligned, but also just word, word loads and stores. Um, it can sometimes be quite awkward to support subword operations for uh, memory mapped I/O, um, and certainly if you want to support uh, unaligned operations, it becomes even more awkward. Um, and so it's pretty common to just not really support those. Um, the, the normal semantics of, of loads and stores. Uh, usually don't aren't fully respected if you're doing memory mapped IO anyway. Uh, and so we will kind of take that as a license. I mean, what we're doing right now is going to be temporary anyway, but um, just to, to preface the special case hack I'm doing to say that similar things do happen in hardware as well sometimes. Um, so anyway, um, let's, um, let's uh, basically, uh, let's do something like this. Um, first, I think it would probably be a good idea to abstract this away from just always being zero-based um, to do something like this and say, um, um, let's not worry about wrap around at the top of memory. Um, RAM end. This is not really RAM start. It would be heart.ram start and heart.ram end. And so um, want to subtract off the base address here. Of course, that's going to uh, introduce some errors. So for now, let's just keep um, keep it as it was, uh, essentially zero-based, but now using this more general interface. Um, let's see here. Hmm. 
maybe we should abstract this into a struct. I'll call it bus. Um, let's see here. Um, yeah, let's do it like that. So, so we're going to create this structure called bus, which sort of abstracts a memory bus um, and the memory mapping and, uh, and memory address translate or, or decoding that's implicit in that. Um, and so rather than directly saying a heart is associated with a um, um, with a, a RAM, we're just going to say it's associated with a bus. And um, I think for this, then we'll just say um, bus read um, word or load bus load word. And uh, let's see, what do we want to pass here? The bus and the address. So this is where, just with this, again, we're not gonna, we're gonna add something in a sec, but for now, let's just abstract it out a little bit. Um, so let's say if uh, bus ram start, if this thing is in range, um, and it has to, the whole four byte uh, range of byte has to be in range um, for this to work, then we um, we just directly let's see we um, cast this to um, First, do the bytewise pointer arithmetic, and so this would be uh, RAM plus uh, adder minus bus RAM start, um, something like that. And we want to do the load as a as a UN32. Right, so that stuff no longer works, and um,
Let's see if that still works. Let's see if it loaded that successfully. So now that that's abstracted out a little bit, um, let's um, let's do the thing I mentioned. Uh, and for now, I'm just literally going to do a uh, um, like I'm going to do some stupid address, and I'm just going to have a hard coded memory map. Um, Put adder, get char, and put char, and uh, I mean I don't know. We can also use some. Um, let's just use these two addresses here. Um, and again, we're not going to worry about um, supporting it for these subword quantities. Um, and actually, we could, I mean, you can have the same, this is actually not uncommon with memory mapped IO. You can have the same address kind of work, depending on whether you're reading or writing, you can have it work as a kind of, you can have it essentially have different effects. Um, so, but let's just make them separate locations, just to avoid confusion. Um, so, if you have uh, put jar adder, then we do put jar data. Um, So the thing that could be, I guess, interesting at this point is um, like let's put in some, let's just put it in before everything else or maybe here. Um, put in some code that does a get char and then it will actually read from the keyboard and it should get it into a register that way. Um, but first, we have to figure out how to do a load word from a some general full 32-bit location. Um, and so we probably want to have some new um, like uint32 thing here. And this is not going to be uh, relative to anything else, and so I think really what we want to do simply is uh, we want to do LUI into the destination register. Um, so this is just using it as a temp register. Uh, LUI and um, and then load word reg. Um, Something like that. Of course, I don't think we've implemented LUI yet, um, but it's the same sort of deal as AUIPC. Is it implemented? Right. Okay, so we should be able to. Um, we should be able to just do a load word into let's let's say x five um, from get char adder. Um, 
And so when I press enter, it should execute the first instruction. Okay, and it put the value 10. I guess 10 is a new line. Let's see. Um, ASCII table. I, I can never remember that stuff. It's very rare. Especially when it's Sentai. Um, yeah, so 10 is a new line. So that was actually correct. Um, let's actually take out this get char. Um, and let's just make a kind of pseudo instruction for doing get char. So um, I'm just going to say, uh, do this thing here, and let's do it for put char as well. Um, this we need. Something like that. We need to do the the, uh, the equivalent of this for uh, store word as well. And I guess to me at least it makes sense to put that operand on that side. Um, and so maybe a temp register. So put in the temp register, those high bits. Um, and then for the store, we want to store to um, yeah, temp register, then the source, and then the I guess the low bits of the dust. Let me just make sure that makes sense. So load the upper immediate bits of the destination into the temp register, and then we want to R is one is used for the address calculation, so it's this plus this, so that makes sense. We want to store that. Um, well, now I guess you can't really overwrite it before it's been written, so we do need a temp register for this. Um, so I guess uh, the next thing we could do would be uh, you do a get char and uh, we can use x1 actually. This is just temporary. Well, it seems like five. To keep it consistent. Um, and then we can print it back. Um, and we can use x6 as a temp register. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, Because I removed this, I guess. Yeah, let's put that back in. At least for now. Um, okay, so it's waiting for me to print something. Let's print X. Um, Okay, I don't know if you can see it, but it printed X there. Um, let's remove both the get char and this. And um, is there a good halt instruction we can use? I don't think there's an officially sanctioned sequence, but well, we can just let it free run, even though that will probably run out of memory to God knows what. But um, let's try that. So now if I press X, okay, that was pretty boring. 
x, so it prints x back. Actually, so let's put this in a loop. Um, Um, no, this called repeat. Do sim here, <clears throat> and just go back to the top. So this is just a dumb echo loop. It's very exciting, I'm sure. But um, anyway, that is memory mapped IO in its very simplest form. Of course, normally this would be tied to some real hardware peripheral rather than just a, a, a kind of an API function in the host environment. But um, in theory, this could be like, you know, a UART. Um, I would say the thing that's maybe unrealistic about this is um, typically if you have something like a UART, which is a, you know, it's a basically like a byte, byte stream, right, in both directions. Um, if you call the equivalent of get char for UART, typically it doesn't block synchronously if the buffer is empty. Um, I guess that's another thing I should mention. If you do, that's just how get char works. But um, if I type um, hello world, um, it actually prints out all of the characters, right? Because it's buff it's line buffered on uh, on our side. So um, the first time it's going to block waiting for input because there's nothing in the queue, but then uh, subsequently, all the get chars are going to be non-blocking until it runs out of characters in the queue. Um, but if this was something like a real UART for you know a real piece of hardware, typically what happens is you just get zero or some other sentinel value if the buffer is empty when you try to read from it, um, and you're you're supposed to look at some status register to monitor whether there's more data before you read it, uh, and maybe you get interrupts when there's new data or something. There's some kind of mechanism for signaling it other than just reading it and getting blocked if it's uh if there's no data but um but yeah but other than that this is pretty representative of simple memory mapped io so that's uh, roughly speaking that's how you go beyond just ram and stuff like that and have side effects or connect to you know peripherals or stuff like that um so just just to look at how simple it was it was really just a matter of extending our memory map from just addressing a block of RAM to um, you know, having a comparison that defers to, in this case, just uh, some standard uh, library functions, get chart and put chart. But um, um, essentially all that's involved on the simulator side in order to make this more general purpose, typically, if you look at something like MAME, uh, and other kind of emulator frameworks that are that are not designed with a fixed set of peripherals, but uh, that have um, you know you can you know if if you go and look at actually let me just show it to you um, if you go and look at the main source code, which I recommend as a good leisure time anyway. If you go and look at what's an example um, x what is it outrun Sega X board. Um, which is one of the things I looked at recently. Um, this is an arcade board, and this was a 60 uh, Motorola 68000 processor. So I think if you look at um, let's see, what is it called? Um, Maybe it's just called run or O run. Yeah, O run. Um, so the way MAME is structured, um, so, so for people who don't know, MAME is, uh, was originally a, uh, I guess, only for uh, our simulating, emulating uh, historical legacy arcade systems. Um, but one of the things that's neat about it is that it has this very modular. Well, it's interesting just as a, a piece of history if you want to learn about how things worked. Uh, historically, you can go and read the source code and figure out how hardware worked. Um, but another thing is they have this architecture for uh, basically implementing modular hardware components in emulation and then kind of snapping them together so that you can build a generic uh, CPU core and then hook it up to a bunch of peripherals and configure a memory map accordingly um, rather than having to hard code the specific combination of those uh, 
peripherals. Um, so, you know, for example here, so I don't know this in detail, but I'm just kind of assuming, but you can see you can, um, you can set a certain, there, there's like this mapper thing and you can set a certain range of memory uh, to have a certain callback. So you can see here for this range of memory, um, you can specify the read delegate and the write delegate. So these are the callbacks that get called when you read and write from that range of memory. So if you look at this one, um, I'm going to search for that in the source code. Oh, that's where we were. Right, so you can see this just differs to, uh, to another function, which we can also search for as well. Um, but yeah, you can see this, so this gets called back uh, in order to emulate the functionality of road control read and write. Let's see what this is about. Um, where is the source address? Okay, so that comes from there. But yeah, anyway, so the, the, the point is, uh, if you want to do a more modular emulation architecture, uh, something like this is a pretty good way to go. In other words, have a uh, configurable memory map that defers to callback functions that implement the desired behavior. Um, but again, typically for performance reasons, you you sometimes do want to have a fast path for uh, for RAM because RAM, you know, as a proportion of, of total uh, memory reads and writes, uh, plain memory uh, requests outnumber memory mapped I/O by. Actually, I, I guess I should qualify that. There are de definitely old systems where, um, and I guess even currently with certain kinds of embedded devices where the ratio is not so extreme. But uh, but, but take if you take a modern PC, for example, as one other extreme, uh, I don't know what the ratio of, I mean, if you think about it, so first off, user code in general, you know, anything that executes in user space doesn't do memory mapped IO typically. That would be very rare um, if, if that ever happened. Um, and that accounts for most CPU time, right? So anyway, um, I don't know what the ratio is, but it's certainly in the millions to one or something like that. So optimizing for the case where you hit this is a good idea. Um, and so, for example, you can imagine having some code like this where the else ca clause calls the more heavyweight address decoding and dispatch uh, routine. Um, but for now, we're just hard coding this one example. Um, all right, so that was one thing I wanted to show today. I don't have a whole lot of stuff in the docket, um, but because um, I'm not feeling super good, but um, that was one thing I, di I did want to show uh, if people were wondering about how you do memory mapped I.O. This is one way of doing it in an emulator. Um, next thing is um, what would be fun to show? Let's see. I was thinking of writing a code generator that emits code in some general way um, for like a stack machine, maybe. Um, like if we go back to the original homework, um, let's see if I can find that in my trusty notes file. For homework two, all the way back in the day, um, I had, I guess it was a two part homework thing where um, building a compiler to target a just a, a homemade bytecode stack machine um, and then actually implementing the stack machine and um, one thing we could do is we could implement a um, we could implement a compiler um, from um, that, that, that actually generates risk 5 code directly using our dynamic assembler um, which would be kind of an example of a very kind of toy-like compiler that generates uh, RISC-V code directly. So that might be interesting to do. Um, but I think what I'm going to do instead of doing the parser, because then I have to either rewrite the parser or do something else, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, 
do a stack oriented um like i'm basically going to convert from rpn like i'm going to take as input rpn um you know almost like pseudo fourth or something like that and i'm going to generate the corresponding risk 5 code into memory and then we can execute it um and so that sidesteps uh, most of the issues with uh, doing the parser, which wouldn't take long to do because we've written a bunch of these by now, but um, it's kind of besides the point. So maybe let's do a um, like an RPN uh, to RISC V uh, code generator. So the idea would be, uh, and I'm not even going, I think I'm not even going to do lexing, so I'm just going to do character by character uh, uh, parsing where uh, each digit is independently written, like it, it reads a character at a time and it executes an operation associated with that. So for example, 4, 4 plus would be something like push 4, uh, push 4, push 4, add um, uh, 1 minus would then be uh, push 1 sub, you know, this sort of thing. Um, but the idea is we would read this in ASCII from an ASCII string and we would emit these corresponding instructions. And so this should be pretty simple. Um, this is basically just implementing, you can think of it as almost implementing a conversion from this kind of uh, stack machine uh, format to, uh, to RISC-V. So converting from sort of an abstract uh, instruction set to, um, to something quote unquote real, although running in our emulator. Um, so I think I can probably finish that before the end of the stream. I don't feel like doing an extra stream. So maybe let's try doing that. Um, not the most interesting thing in the world, but um, potentially interesting, I suppose. So um, so let's just do that. Um, so let, let me just make a function called uh, gen RPN. And I take a, again, I, I'm not in C anymore. <laughs> uh, gen RPN, and I take a string. Um, just going to take take this thing here and I'm just going to directly assemble and generate code uh, into the assembly buffer that that is provided and um, so I'm going to um, say something like this um, and I'll say if is digit then we'll um, we'll generate a push And uh, maybe to make things interesting, I will have, uh, I will, yeah, actually that's cool. Let's do get char and put char. So I will have two functions and I will call them question mark for reading and uh, bang or uh, this for, um, so let's say um, uh, get char and push, um, pop and put char, something like that. So uh, in addition to these things here, there will also be a question mark, which will do a get char and convert it to a, you know, a digit uh, and push that on the stack. And uh, this will pop the top element from the stack and it will write it to, um, to the terminal. And since we already have these things, it seems like a, I hadn't thought of this, but this I think makes it a little bit more interesting and, and interactive than actually even our old uh, homework calculator because that one didn't have any IO capabilities. So this makes it a little more interesting. Um, and so um, uh, let's say here, in this case, we're just going to say, uh, you know, the value is going to be um, this minus whatever. Um, and uh, we have to implement our push and pop functionality, which um, I will just, um, I will just make, you know, the, the way this is going to work basically is uh, we will have a stack pointer that we will manage ourselves. There's no built-in push or pop in RISC-V, of course, but we can just do that uh, ourselves with a pointer that we bump, uh, just like we would in C or whatever. Um, so I think, um, let's say X1 is our uh, stack pointer. And... Um, And so I think what you want to do is, uh, when you have this value, you, um, you want to do a store Well, let's see here. 
um, we also have to reserve an area of memory. And so let's do let, let's do that actually. Um, um, so stack size. Let's see here. Uh, stack size. I guess we'll reserve. First of all, let's just align it. So align it to a four byte. And then um, I guess we'll just fill in zeros for the stack size. Um, and then I guess what I'll do is I will turn a symbol corresponding to the start address. So new sim here. And then once we're done assembling all this stuff, we'll return that label. Um, and uh, so, th so this is for the push. And when we want to do the push, I guess what we have to do is we have a stack pointer uh, and we should load the stack pointer. Um, let's do a pseudo instruction for that. Um, So the standard way of synthesizing a move is just to use um, add i. Well, I guess you can do it in different ways, but um, you can do it this way at least. Um, so uh, you can do add dest source x zero. That's one way to do it. Um, and if you want to do um, with a an immediate, at least if it's a small immediate. Um, I guess you would do it like this. All right, so for the stack pointer, well, let's see, I'll just sim here. Um, Actually, I guess I should just use load, load LA does exactly what I want here. So I don't need another one for that. Um, so I do LA X1 stack. So we're just going to have the stack grow up. Um, and so what I want to do for this case is I just want to um, Well, let's see. So I have to first, let's say X2 is our temp register. And so X2, um, let's see, X2, we put in the value here. And then I have to store to um, the current value. Although I think the operand order for this is not what I expect. This is R is one plus. So I think it should be.
RS1, and then X2, and then zero, because this thing already contains the offset. And then I want to, um, what is it? Um, I want to increment this by four. Let's see if this works. Let's just see here. Move this immediate into um, into X two. Then store that value to X one plus the contents of X one plus zero, and X one contains the stack pointer, and then increment the stack pointer by four. Um, I guess we can also do a big switch. Let's just do plus for now. Um, so for plus, what do we want to do? We want to, let me think. Um, we want to load RD is first, and then RS, okay. So for plus, um, you want to load into um, X2 the contents of X1 minus four, and you want to load into X3 the contents of X1 minus eight, um, and then you want to add x2 and x3. And then you want to store back um, I guess you want to store it back to x1 minus eight. Um, we want to store back the value of x2 and then you want to um, subtract four, something like that. This should probably be in a function gen op um, or gen binary op, let's say. Um, and then this thing goes in here. And then you can just say gen bin op as in uh, add. Should be able to do the same thing for x minus. Um, I guess.
guess you play this one, we'll say. something like this. And then we do the memory map IO cases, which is um, Um, I guess in this case, you just directly store here. We can actually implement. Um, implement like this, I suppose. All right, um, and so now for reading from stuff, uh, we want to use it as in get char. What do we call that? As in get char, we'll just use x2, and then we'll say push reg as in x2. We should do a pop reg as well, I suppose. Um, Maybe we should just use that for everything rather than these fancier instruction sequences because it's more readable. Um, so we want to load into destination from x1 minus 4 to the top of stack, and then um, we will subtract 4. I mean, you could also do this first and then just, you could also do this. That's fine as well. Um, and maybe we should use this even because it's maybe a little bit uh, easier to read, uh, even if it's not as efficient. Um, let's do, um, pop these, and then push the result. It reads quite a bit simpler. So pop, pop, add them, or combine them with whatever op, and then push the result back. Let me just make sure these are right. Um, subtract four from the stack pointer, and then load from the stack pointer. Pushing, we store into that value, and then we do that. Yeah, that looks correct. Pushing the immediate, we just, actually, this should be li, not move m. Li does a fancier sequence, I think. For now, let's just uh, verify that. Um, Yep. 
do I call those things? Okay, what were, what were those called? Oh, right. Alrighty. Um, let's just reread this in light of that. Um, when we read a digit, we just push that digit. Um, when we get a question mark, then we, of course, should implement that. Um, we do the get char into x2 and then we push x2 and for this we should uh, pop the register into x2 and then put char x2 and we have to use x3 as a temp um, First, we're going to just uh, kind of hand assemble it. Yeah, let's do that. Um, let's take a bunch of this out of rotation for now. Um, and let's do gen RPN. Let's start with some simple, uh, some simple patterns, like. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess the simplest would just be, um, maybe not that simple, but let's try uh, reading something and writing something back. Um, we're going to assign it to this symbol because right now the start address is that. So um, yeah, uh, which would read something and then write it back, I suppose. No, so this is not quite right, by the way. The thing we want to actually put char is this, because we have to convert back to ASCII. Um, and actually, I suppose we should do a little bit better than that if it's a multi-digit thing. But let's do this for single-digit stuff for now. Uh, and let's just say we have a one kilobyte stack. Let's just step through it the first time. Okay, so that certainly didn't, um, I guess let's actually step through this stuff.
Okay, so this is prompting for the uh, the get char. So the get char is getting called. Well, I guess. So certainly that part is not being called. Let's let's put back this thing just to see what's going on. So we start at Sure, that looks reasonable. So the very first first thing we do is we load the effective stack address. Yeah, which should be zero because it's at the start of memory. Um, Okay, so now it's reading the get char, let's say four. I guess if we look at our ASCII table, 52 is the ASCII. Oh, I see at least one of the problems. Yeah, 52. So we have to uh, do that conversions ourselves. Um, push reg. Right, so we shouldn't push the ASCII code. We should um, subtract. Oh yeah, what am I doing here? This is total garbage. This is not the time it's supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen at runtime, not at assembly time. Um, so I have the value in x2, and I guess I'm supposed to do an add, an immediate add of um, x2 with minus. minus 48 because then we subtract off that ASCII value. We have to do the same thing for the put char as well, but let me just see if that is, first of all, getting the right thing into memory. Okay, so now we have four. Let's try that again. Nine, so that's right. And then for this, we have to sort of do the, the other direction, um, which is adding 47, or 48 rather.
Okay, here we go. Okay, so we got we got out four. Um, let's put in some sort of halt pseudo instruction, just so I can. Oh, actually, we don't need to do that. Um, let's just implicitly loop the whole sequence. Um, so we just assemble a jump back to the start. that single step crap. Okay, so now it's just doing that. Um, but now let's use a more complicated program um, where it uh, reads a value and then adds two. Okay, I don't know why it's printing that extra thing. Oh, it's because the new line is coming in as well, of course, because it's line buffered. Um, yeah, that's a little bit awkward. Um, let's, let's do a hack just to ignore that, even though that's... Just to, yeah. Okay, so that's good. Let's just put these in first to make it cleaner to read. And actually, let's put this in. We can do that ourselves. Um, I guess it's ten, right? Um, let's also put in some kind of dupe, uh, like let's say the D is duplication. So duplication basically means, um, well, let's do it the dumb way. Uh, we pop one in and then we push it. 
uh, you push it twice Um, because then we can do doubling, so we say read it, duplicate it, and then add them together. And we get eight. And of course we get ASCII if we're out of that range. So right now this um, digit printing is pretty crappy, but um, let's say that's okay for now. And I think we're right on the one point, uh, one hour and 30 minutes mark, so I think this is a good place to stop. Um, but anyway, so what did we get? Um, actually further than I expected, but this was pretty easy. But um, but we now have a very simple-minded RPN code generator that um, takes a little program in RPN notation and treats it sort of as an infinite loop uh, where it has IO, IO, uh, digit IO, and uh, simple arithmetic ops we could obviously add more but um this seems like a decent place well and maybe it was a little more fancy let's let's add one more thing let's say um how does the order here go one minus so it's the top minus the second top most so i guess we can take the digit wise complement if we do like this So then that's nine nine minus two. Something like this. Anyway. Yeah, so a, a little a little code generator using this runtime assembler in a way that's pretty representative of how you would write a real compiler backend, although obviously this language is a toy language, but uh, I think you see the idea of how you can use a runtime assembler. So this is effectively a JIT. Um, all right, uh, I think that's it for today. Um, I'm, I, I've been thinking about taking next week off to focus on, um, because I'm so be, I wanted to write articles um, and I feel kind of guilty that I'm behind on that. And I think it would help get more people, um, get more people interested, I guess, um, now that we're kind of moving on to more hardware oriented stuff. So um, I haven't decided yet, but um, it may turn out that I'll take streams off for next week and just go, focus on articles and kind of get caught up on that. Um, probably we'll still do some hobby coding or some some coding as well, but uh, it won't be stream focused. But uh, but yeah, I think this is a good place to uh, this is a good kind of bookmark or mini milestone for the runtime assembler. Um, but uh, I'll keep people posted about whether uh, what will happen next week. But uh, high likelihood that I'll take it off to write some articles. Anyway, uh, hope people enjoyed this. Um, I think this is a pretty cool little demo. So uh, anyway, have fun um, next week if I don't talk to everyone. See ya.